Welcome to the Bible Balance HealthCast, episode number 505. Filling your script doesn't treat your problem unless you take it as directed. Bio Balance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Bio Balance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the things that being a parent and a psychologist and a teacher, I, uh, I learned about early in my life was something called wishful thinking. Children developmentally go through a phase called wishful thinking uh, as part of their progression into learning, learning how to think, learning how to problem solve, uh, learning how to acquire information, and reality test. But all of us retain an element of wishful thinking in our mental capacities. You see an example of it uh, in an athletic ritual. You find a, a baseball player, a batter, steps into the batter's box, and they go through a certain repetitive routine that they've sort of figured out that one time they, they did this and they hit a home run. And so if they do this repetitively, mm-hmm. uh, repeatedly, then in exactly the same way, if they get it exactly right, they'll hit another home run. You see it in and, golf, too. Do, do, yeah, you yeah I mean, athletes, you see it in all kinds Everybody of Everybody, like, lines up the same. They make two or three Two or God three forbid. or ten, yeah. yeah you know, I, mean, I hate to play swings. behind one of those guys. Yeah, I yeah. Know. Or they, or they, you know, they they sh- shift their hips. They, you know, they and wiggle they so many times each take way. Take a deep yeah. breath, and you know, they do it the same every single time. Yeah. And so that's the same the same idea. But I didn't realize that wishful thinking. Well, it has was to do with just discovering accidentally as a child, like like where I learned about it is a, a child learning object permanence. Mm-hmm. Object permanence means that they, until they're nine months old, they don't have object permanence. So if they drop a toy, the toy's gone. Mm-hmm. If they, you go away out of sight, you're gone. They mm-hmm. don't know that you exist independently of their immediate connection. So say you have a child in a bed in a, with, with a room with two doors, and they see mom go by this door, and they're looking over here waiting on her to come back. Then she comes through this door. Mm-hmm. Eventually, they learn that she exists out of sight, and they mm-hmm. can track her and expect her to come in this well, that's door. That's what peekaboo is about. That's what peekaboo is all so about. That, and that's how the you game test. You play, you play with your child. Right. And, and Kate, even at you know, almost two years old, still laughs oh, when yeah. we do peekaboo. Yeah. You know, so. Oh, they love it. It's a game they yeah. can win. <laughs> they can figure it out. Like, hey, I yeah. know this one. Uh-huh. But that is what you do. And so, one of the ways you track your child's progress, if, if a toy falls off of the high chair, and they haven't developed object permanence, they're not going to look for it. They're just going to scream because they want some attention. But they will start to look for it, mm-hmm. and then they and then you start playing peekaboo with them. They'll start throwing the damn thing off to make you, right. you know, who's training whom. Right, they uh, are feeding the dog. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, or whatever. But so we retain that process as part of our thinking process all along. And, and where this came up for me, again, when I was teaching anthropology, mm-hmm. we were talking about how so many people receive prescriptions from physicians for medical issues. Uh, maybe it's an antibiotic prescription. And they're supposed to take it for 10 days, so many each day at certain mm-hmm. times for 10 days. And after three days, they feel better, so they quit taking it. And they put it in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom, and they save it against some anticipated future need. Someday I will need this. And I knew a lot of people growing up, my grandparents' generation, my parents' generation, that had mm-hmm. medicine cabinets that were full of Old Half prescriptions, used prescriptions that they and, and they even forgot eventually what they were for. Which is when you should throw them away yeah. because oh. you'll take them for the wrong well, reason. And, and sometimes they had in my family, stupid as we were, <laughs> they put pet medicines in the in the <laughs> medicine cabinet as well. If they took their dog to the vet and he gave them a prescription and they give it to the dog for two or oh, three no. days so you feel better, so yeah, well then we'll save these. You know, and they they'd be in there too, like ear drops and eye drops and stuff. <laughs> And so then you'd wonder, is this a dog prescription or is this my prescription? You know, I mean, it, it's not very bright. It's not very healthy. It's not very good. But that's, but that's how people thinking. think. That's all Wishful strange thinking from that, that you're concept. going to It's need a magical it again. protection. It's like a rabbit's foot oh, okay. against possible harm. So I'll keep that prescription because someday 
either I or somebody in my family may need it. And being, you know, an amateur doctor, I'll say, well, hey, I got a medicine for that. Let me give it to you. Right. I know moms that do that. I know sisters that well, do I that. Well, I can do that because I know what Well, you are for. a doctor. That makes, <laughs> you prescribe the But I don't not take it till the end. You know, you, if you don't take no, it till the end, you no. develop a super infection. But, so that's that's. But a, all of you ask yourselves, go look in your medicine cabinet. <laughs> see if there's something there you don't know what it is or how that's long it's been there. That's wishful thinking. And, so, and that's also not good care because I'm thinking more of chronic, chronic things like for example, I'll um, put somebody on metformin because they have prediabetes. Right. And I say, are you taking this every day? Are you taking two of them every day with food at night with your largest meal? Oh, yeah, I'm taking that. And then I look at their lab, and their lab shows their sugar to be just as high as it was when we started. Yeah. And I, so my thought is, oh, I don't have you on enough. Right. I need to increase your dose. So then I... I write a new prescription for more of that medicine. And then I find out, yeah, you filled it, but it's sitting it in your in your uh, medicine cabinet and you're not taking it. You think the fact that you filled it is going to be enough to overcome your prediabetes. My wife comes and, and says, over- why do we have 500 of these? <laughs> Just like, oh, I've been taking them, you know. Uh-huh, right. Yeah, so exactly. same with supplements. Yeah. You're supposed to take, so we use supplements oftentimes like we would use a medication, only you can buy it, it's cheaper, it has more months that you can get, it's not controlled. So so you can actually, it's easier to get It's and it's less expensive. So we use those as, as medication. And then we find out that they bought two months worth and then they didn't, buy any more. Well, I'm looking I don't know that before they come in. I'm looking at their lab and interpreting it and I'm finding out that say their cortisol is still twice normal. Well, that's bad. That's not healthy and I need to take care of that and and then they may lie to me or they may tell me the truth that they're not taking it or that that it ran out and they didn't refill it. But if you're taking supplements that your doctor gave you, you should be taking those just like you would medicine every single day and figure out a way to do it. You know, if you can't remember or if you're supposed to take it with food, you should, like you guys carry metformin with you, mm-hmm. you know, so you if have you travel, it with right. you when you yeah. travel or when you go out to eat or or so that you have it with you. Right. So sometimes it's just, oh, I forgot. And then you take it on an empty stomach and it doesn't do any good. Right. So you have to take it with food. So not only do you have to take it, you have to take it the same the way you're supposed well, to. Take and it. I have to understand it's a preventative. I mean, I have a family history of diabetes, and my family is pretty mm-hmm. severe, and I'm genetically predisposed. And while I don't have it now, mm-hmm. I I have to be aware that my blood sugars do play games with me, and mm-hmm. so the best way for it right now is to be handled is with mm-hmm. metformin. So right. I have to take metformin regularly. But having said that, yeah. Um, the reason your blood sugars are under control is because you're on that and you're, you lost 30 pounds and you yeah. eat properly and you exercise. All those things so, make a difference. So yeah. because you did all those things, you don't really have diabetes now, mm-hmm. but you still have the potential if you didn't do those things. Right. So, so you and, and you didn't it. take the medicine. Yeah. And, you, you know, those are all things that, that can reoccur if you're not taking the medicine. I have a problem with doctors. My favorite pet peeve is thyroid, of course. <laughs> so patients patients will go to their doctor, and I have their thyroid perfect. Their TSH is perfect. Their T3 and their T4 are perfect. They take their lab to their doctor, and their doctor goes, look, it's perfect. Stop taking your thyroid medicine. Well, it's perfect because they're taking their thyroid medicine. It's not perfect. It didn't become perfect, and then you don't need the medicine. Right, but once it's, you get it to the once you get it home there, base, then you stop taking it, and it, it comes back. And you back. just go back. You go back to where you were, and right, your hair falls yo-yo. out, and, yeah. you, and you gain 10 pounds, and you're miserable and sleepy right. and tired. So, I mean, all the symptoms come back. But, but a doctor should know that, that if you're on thyroid and your symptoms are gone and your levels are perfect, that's the perfect level. Keep taking it. So you decided – that we would talk about this in this podcast because mm-hmm. you get a digital subscription of something called Medscape. Yes. And they, they, they're like news feeds, and you get headlines about this or that or the other, and you click on those, and then mm-hmm. there's an article that you mm-hmm. read. The headline that you saw said that fewer than one in five, 20%, fewer than 20% of hypogonadic men are adherent to prescribed topical testosterone treatment. Translation now, is guys with low T don't put the gels on. Exactly. So the prescription, the topical, means it's, you rub it on your skin. And if you get a prescription for topical testosterone, you're supposed to put it on a couple times a day, mm-hmm. uh, every day. 
And what mm-hmm. this study said, they, they surveyed uh, 3,184 3, men. And they said of that 3,184 men, less than 17% consistently applied the gel. Right. So 84% didn't. And within a year, most of them had stopped even filling the prescription. Mm-hmm. They tried it for a while. And they probably put one in the medicine cabinet to use if they really got desperate and needed mm-hmm. it. But that's a common I mean, it's a good example of a common problem. Right. People who get a prescription, and and another very common one is antibiotics. A less common one that I have more experience with personally is prescriptions for ADD. Mm -hmm. A lot of different clients that I Mm -hmm. saw had ADD meds. There are a dozen different meds for ADD. And in some families, poor families particularly, they run out of the Mm -hmm. med and they they don't have it. They can't afford to get it. But they may have two or three children that have Mm -hmm. prescriptions but they may be different prescriptions. So one for focal and one for Adderall, one for something else. Mm -hmm. And the moms think, well, I'll just give him one of his brothers because it's all the same. It's not the same. No, it's not. And it's dangerous to take yeah. a medicine for a while. And, and Doses are different. And stop taking it. Yeah. Just on I mean, your own or, or play with the dose up or down. Like, oh, one of these is good. Maybe two will be better. But part of the, the problem is also that your, your doctor thinks you're taking this, and then you go in and say it's not working. Yeah. Well, they switch you to something else, probably more expensive, because you're not taking it. You didn't tell them you're not taking it, and that's why it's not working. But I can promise you, if you're not taking a medicine and there's supposed to be an outcome either on lab or symptoms, and you don't take it, it's not working because of you, not because of the medicine or because the doctor chose the wrong one. I'm not looking at blame. I'm looking to try to get you to motivate yourself to actually develop a a protocol for yourself, a a habit, a new habit of taking your medicine. And for men, it involves an awareness that they typically don't have. Men in our culture often do not develop self-awareness. And so if a physician asks them, well, how does that feel? How are you feeling? How's this working? Is that helping? How much? On a scale of one to 10, where we, men don't know. So you regularly have their wives or daughters come in with them because mm-hmm. they'll have that information. Not all men. I mean, honestly, no, I have, no, I I have a huge array of different types of guys. Some guys write everything down. They keep it in their computer. <laughs> Those aren't real men. Those are obsessive compulsive guys. Yeah. But they, but it helps them stay on yes, track. Yes, of course it does. And so I, so I love engineers. You engineers out there, I love you guys. You guys come in. You have everything you've done for the last four months or six months on a spreadsheet. I get to look at it. You tell me when you didn't take it, when you did take it, how you felt. I'm like. This is perfect because then I don't have to drag it out of you. Did you take it? Did you, you know, stop taking it? Did you? I would this, caution you. There's a very thin line between being literal and being anal. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but for my for what I'm doing, what all, all I have to yeah, say the then is, guys. you don't have to write this all down as long as you do this because this is perfect. Right. You know, but not everybody can do that, and I have to say I can't do that. I'm not an engineer either, but. <laughs> So, so the study referenced in uh, Medscape mm-hmm. was about testosterone gels, which mm-hmm. you used to use in the early days of mm-hmm. your practice, mm-hmm. but do not any longer recommend. Right. Tell us why. Because it, it only makes men feel better and cure, helps their symptoms of ED for about a month. Because most, at first, you get lots of testosterone. Then, as you, get, as you take more of it and apply more of it to your skin, your skin starts making more and more estrogen out of it, and it ends up being about 60 to 80% of that testosterone ends up to be estrogen. Well, when, you, when men get estrogen, it counteracts the effects of testosterone. So typically what I'd hear from a patient that came to see me for pellets because the, the gels failed, which they did, they took it, they'd take it for a month, and they'd feel great at first, then they'd feel terrible, so their doctor would double the dose. So they so they'd overcome that estrogen they made last month with the first two weeks of this month, and with a higher dose, and then all of a sudden they're making more estrogen, and then it counteracts it. And so they kept going up in dose, which is a huge price. I mean, they could spend almost as much as a thousand dollars a month on on gels, and going up that way, and yeah. it never made them a shorter and shorter benefit. better. It, yeah. it gave them just a little benefit. So of course, if they were really compliant like that and took it. It didn't work. And there's most men had that issue. And then they come to me and they say, well, I hear this is different. And it is. Right. It doesn't have that same problem. The pellets are under the skin. They're absorbed uh, through your bloodstream, just like 
the testosterone that men make in their testicles. It's, it's absorbed right into the blood. So it doesn't have to change into something to get into your body. So, so that's so why you, I don't use it. You put a pellet in the fat tissues of the, of the hip or the buttocks. Mm-hmm. And that then is a reservoir. It's an mm-hmm. on-demand supply, mm-hmm. just like your testicles used to provide, mm-hmm. as your body needs it based on your metabolism and, and your and activity health. activity level. And it generates testosterone. Mm-hmm. Then you still have to measure and make a distinction between how much free testosterone as opposed mm-hmm. to total testosterone mm-hmm. that they're getting. Right. You, did you have that information or that issue with, with the gels? When I was when I was doing gels for people, we um, we started doing some blood work on them to see what happened, but it was so dependent on when they took the gel. Mm-hmm. If they were hot, if they were cold, if they were exercising, if they weren't exercising, it was it was just like an array of different blood tests that were not reproducible. So gels were not. I couldn't follow gels with blood tests. Right. Because it varies during the day, it varies during the person, it varies during the weather. I mean, which is bad for the patient because that means every day is a different day and you need your testosterone every single day. And, and that is a thing that we often don't know or don't recognize about medicines in general. Like I've been reading some articles lately that say if you're on a blood pressure medicine, mm-hmm. you're less likely to have a heart attack if you take your blood pressure medicine in the evening or mm-hmm. at bedtime, mm-hmm. not in the morning. And yet most men... Take it in the morning when they get up. Well, oral medicines, you know, if you're going from, for, for them, for, for their left to right, um, basically medicines go up when you take it. Right after you take it, there's a peak. And then it, ki- it falls over time before the next dose. Yeah. It's so, called titration? So it, it yeah, it, well, the medicine, it goes through your stomach and it starts out at a high level and then it starts being used up or dissolving or being... Uh, going out your kidneys or whatever, okay. but it starts decreasing because it's one, if it's one dose. If you have two doses, it goes like this yeah. on in a day, but it still goes down at the end of the day. So if you want to have your best blood pressure control, a when you're when you're sleeping, when, so it doesn't make you tired, and b when most people have heart attacks, then that's nighttime, and so the best time to take blood pressure medicine is at night if you can remember it. If you can't remember it, then it doesn't do any good to schedule it then because that's it's not going to happen. So we were talking about what, what can you as a physician, what can we as a society do to improve the likelihood that people will actually take medicines that are prescribed for them in the manner and timing for which they're given. And one of the things that comes up is the fear factor. If you frighten them to death and you say, you're going to have a heart attack in three days if you don't take this medicine, I'm certainly more likely to take it for the next three days. But what did the fright do to you? I don't know. But, but, <laughs> but I know scaring that. you may have caused you to have a heart attack in three days. I mean, I'm not sure it, that that's... It certainly that. might. But, but telling you the truth about about your situation, how, mm-hmm. how critical is this medication? Yeah. And how critical is it that you take it every day? Right. That's important. Right. So uh, I, I view that as... My last resort. Okay. Okay. I like pellets because I put them in. I know when they go in. I know how much goes in. I know how, how what the blood work out. is. Yeah. I know how often somebody needs to get them. If you wait an extra month, you're going to have to start kind of start over. Mm-hmm. You know, you should men get it every six months, women every four. If you wait more time, you're going to have to have lower levels and start slower on your next dose. But that I can control. I can't control going home with you and putting a pill in your mouth right. or putting a gel on you or putting a vag tab inside of you. I can't control that. And I've had, I've had women who slathered gels all over their body. They took a whole month's testosterone, it put felt it really all good. over their body because they thought it felt really good, and they had hair all over their body because mm. it stimulates hair growth. They were kind of gorilla-like. Right. So that... <laughs> So I, you know, I can't prevent that either. So I, I need the best way to control somebody getting their medicine is to put it, give it to the patient. But I think making patients really know that they can get better, mm-hmm. that teaching them to want to be better and want to be healthy. So you can't imagine how much time you're going to save in your life, not going to doctors and not having time tests and money. and money. I mean, tons of money <coughs> and not being on a respirator and not being in an ICU and not having heart heart surgery. 
That's all time out of your life, and it's all money out of your pocketbook and out of the governments as well and your right. insurance company. So all of these things should make you want to be healthy, but you have to keep it in mind mm -hmm. that you want to be healthy, so you want to take your medicines. And another thing that you monitor as a physician when you're thinking of medicines to prescribe for a condition is whether or not the particular options for prescriptions that you could give have negative side effects or adverse side mm -hmm. effects because mm -hmm. the side effects will cause people not to take the medicine right. too. Right. That may be helping my mm -hmm. blood pressure, which I don't track and I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. It's called the silent killer because I, I don't feel it. I'm not in pain. Right. But it may cause me some other issue like diarrhea that I am aware or of. Or ED. Some, it, of the, yeah. some blood pressure medicines cause ED. Yeah. So, so if I discover that, I'm certainly not going to take it. Right. But then that means I'm not getting the medicine for my heart that I need. I mean, right. so you have to discuss with me. Alter there's alternatives. There are alternative so theories. if you have those yeah. kind of side effects, then you need to have a different type or a different family of medicines that does the same thing for you. And another option for physicians now and for patients that's becoming more readily available and especially as we get older, as we get older and we mm -hmm. tend to take more and more different medicines for more and more different issues, they have pill packs now that come preloaded. So mm -hmm. you don't have to get 10 bottles of something and sort them out into mm -hmm. these weekly th or once mm -hmm. a day, however you take your medicines. Mm -hmm. But they just come in a, a Monday pack and a Tuesday mm -hmm. pack. And you know, take this mm -hmm. Monday morning, take this mm -hmm. Tuesday afternoon. And it's, that's pre-calculated for you. Mm -hmm. So that's now available to at least the American public mm -hmm. uh, in a larger degree. And some pills are in um, bubble packs. Like um, I have a patient whose business it is to take medications for Medicaid, Medicare, and, and put them into things that look like what I used to call birth control packs. You know, yeah. you punch out yeah. Monday, you punch out Tuesday, so you know if you've taken them. But, but a problem with many of those is old people, especially that have lost any physical dexterity mm -hmm. or, or vision, mm -hmm. have trouble getting pills out of those packs. Yeah, these this guy's packs are just yeah. poop, poop. Yeah, you're that's just, what I mean, they're yeah, easy. Good, good. So they, they just, and you get a month's worth, and so you know, you even bring them into your doctors to show that you've taken them and that kind of thing, because that helps the doctor know what to do next. They used to do that in primitive societies with birth control pills uh, when they try to give birth control to them mm -hmm. because the community didn't have it, didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. didn't know how to use it. So they would give women a necklace of beads that had seven red beads and 28 green beads. Really? And they were supposed to like, move a bead every day when they took a pill. Huh. And, and then supposedly when they, they get down to seven red at the bottom, don't, no pills, don't have any just sex. Just have a period. Yeah. Uh, well, you're going to have or, a period. Or, yeah. But they... They never Not remember. They were, <laughs> they were remembering to move them this way one day and this way one day, and it was never consistent, so um, it didn't work. Yeah. So sometimes you come up with a great idea, and you think, oh, this will help. Golf. Yeah. <laughs> you just move beads to keep <laughs> yeah. my score. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's so high. So, but the pill packs, you can't, if you can get those, those do help you with co compliance. Yes. Um, pills that make you feel different are easier to manage. In other words, if somebody doesn't take an ADD medicine, they know it within a couple hours because their brain doesn't work. Right. And Our they're scattered. Knows. Yep. And they're, you could, that you could just tell by watching yep. them that they're, they didn't take their ADD medicine. Or if you um, take thyroid, you know pretty much by 10 o'clock, if you were supposed to take it at 6 or 7, that you're, you didn't take it because you want to take a nap, you're, you're hungry, you're swollen, you're, you know, Extremes everything doesn't work. Yeah. So, I mean, there are some things, diuretics, you know if that works because yeah. you know if you have to pee more. Yeah. If you don't have to pee, you know the diuretic didn't work. So that's another thing that people should keep track of with generics. Right. And that is I've had two medications myself where I knew they weren't working. And I had to go back to the pharmacy and say, this prescription doesn't do what it's supposed to do because it had an effect like urinating, like right. a diuretic. Right. So, and they like look at me like, how would you possibly know? Well, if right. you've taken something for a while, you know what it's supposed to do. Right. So I'd send it back and get a different brand of a generic and it would work. Mm. So sometimes the generics don't really have in them what they say they have in them. Yeah. So if you can tell if something's working and it's not working, you need to take it back to the pharmacy and get yeah. a different brand, brand of generic. So that's, I mean, I just find that to be important. Well, and that's um, one reason why doctors have an option on their prescription pad for whether or not generics are acceptable. Well, we can't even, I mean, if you, the state of Missouri is allowing pharmacists to substitute no matter what we no write on No matter what there. you write on it. And okay. there's yeah. also another thing is that the brands are like thousands of dollars a month. Yeah. So, so, so why would you do yeah. that? Right. 
I mean, I wouldn't make that a patient do that. So it is important. It is critically important and maybe even life-saving if you learn to take prescriptions that you need when you need them as they are prescribed. Compliance is a critical component over which you generally have control. So be compliant. Even if you're oppositional, which a lot of men are, try to be compliant <laughs> about taking your medicines. I can tell you like girls more than men because, you know, you're, you're hard on yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.